So, dude, I'm excited for this talk. Before we get into it, um, I want to make sure that we have uh, some pre-conversation housekeeping items that go out. One of which being, as always, we're doing these vector space talks and everyone is encouraged and invited to join in. Ask your questions. Let us know where you're calling in from. Uh, let us know what you're up to, what your use case is, and feel free to drop any questions that you may have in the chat. We will be monitoring it like a hawk. Today, I am joined by none other than Sabrina. How are you doing, Sabrina? What's up, Dimitros? I'm doing great. Excited to be here. I just love seeing what amazing stuff people are building with Quadrant. And Ooh. yeah. Let's go. Let's get into yeah. it. Yeah. So I think I see Sabrina's wearing a special shirt, which is a don't get lost in vector okay. space okay. shirt. Can you see if it? anybody yeah. wants a shirt like that. Yes, let... I want one. <laughs> yes, there we go. Well, we got you covered, dude. You will get one at your front door soon enough. If anybody else wants one, come on here, present at the next vector space talks. We're excited to have you. And we've got one last thing that i think is fun that we can talk about before we jump into the tech piece of uh, the conversation and that is i told sabrina to get ready with some recommendations because you know vector databases they can be used occasionally for recommendation systems but nothing's better than getting that hidden gem from your friend and right now, what we're going to try and do is give you a few hidden gems so that the next time the recommendation engine is working for you, it's working in your favor. And Sabrina, I asked you to give me yeah. one music that you can recommend, one show, and one rando. So basically, some one random thing that you can recommend to us. So I've picked, I, I thought about this. Okay, I give it some thought. <laughs> the movie uh, would be... Catch Me If You Can by uh, Leo DiCaprio and Tom Hanks. Have you guys watched it? Really good movie. Mm. Um, the song would be uh, Oh Children by Nick Cave and The Bad Seeds. Also a very good right. song. And the random recommendation is my favorite scented candle, which is Citrus Nose, Sea Salt, and Cedar. So there you Ooh, go. Ooh, a scented candle as a recommendation. I like it. I think that's yeah. cool. Uh, I didn't exactly tell you to get ready with that. So I'll go next. Then you can have some more time to think. And so for anybody that's joining in, we're just giving a few recommendations to help your own recommendation engines at home. And we're going to get into this conversation about rags in just a moment. But my song is with, oh my God, I've been listening to it because I found it. I didn't think that they had it on Spotify, but I found it this morning and I was so happy that they did. And it is Bill Evans and Chet Baker. Basically their whole album, the legendary sessions is just like incredible. But the first song on that uh, is on that like uh, album is called Alone Together. And when Chet Baker starts playing his little trombone. My God. Mm -hmm. It is like you can feel emotion. You can like touch it. That is what I would recommend. Anyone out there, I'll drop a link in the chat if you like it. The, the film or series, This Fool. If you speak Spanish, it's even better. It is amazing series. Get that. Do it. And as the rando thing, I've been having Rishi Mushroom powder in my coffee in the mornings i highly recommend it all right last <laughs> one let's get into the <laughs> let's get into your recommendations and then we'll get into this rag chat so yeah i sucked a little bit so um, for the song i think um i will give something like because i'm french i think you can hear it so i will choose get lucky of daft punk mm. and because i am a little bit sad of the um, the end of their collaboration so yeah just like uh, I cannot like forget it. Um, 
and it's a really good music like uh, well, miss them um, as a movie maybe something like um, I really enjoy um, so I, we have a lot of French movies that are really nice but something more international maybe and more mainstream um, Django of um, Tarantino that is really a good movie and really enjoy it like uh, I watched it like several times and still a, a good movie to watch and random thing maybe a city um, a city to go uh, to visit um, I really enjoyed um, ah, it's hard to choose really hard to choose no so a, a place in general like uh, in okay Florence like in uh, in Italia there it's we really, go yeah it's a really cool city to go so if you have time and even Sabrina if you went to Europe soon like it's really a nice place to go that is true Sabrina is going to Europe soon we're blowing up her spot right now so hopefully Florence <laughs> is on the list I Absolutely. know that most people watching did not tune in to hearing the three of us just randomly give recommendations. <laughs> we are here to talk more about retrieval augmented generation, but hopefully those recommendations help some of you all at home with your recommendation engines and you're maybe using a little bit of a vector database in your recommendation engine building skills. Let's talk about this though, man, because I think it would be nice if you can set the scene, what exactly are you working on? I know you've got virtual brain. Can you tell us a little bit about that so that we can know how you're doing rags? Mm -hmm. So, yeah, because rag is like, I think the most famous word in the AI sphere um, at the moment. So virtual brain, what we are building, uh, I mean, in particular is that we are building an AI assistant for knowledge workers. So we are not only building like, you know, this next gen search bar to search content uh, through documents. It's a tool for enterprises at enterprise grade that provide some easy way to interact with your knowledge. So basically we create a tool that we connect to the world knowledge of the company. It could be whatever, like the drives, SharePoints, whatever knowledge you have. Um, any kind of documents and with that you will be able to perform tasks on your knowledge such as like audit, uh, RFP, um, due diligence, uh, it's not only like everyone that is building RAG or building like a kind of search system through RAG are always take, giving the same number is that like 20% you, you, as a knowledge worker you spend 20% of your time by searching information. And I think I heard this number so much time and that's true, but it's not enough. Like the search bar, we, a lot of companies, like many companies are working on all to search stuff like for a long time and it's always a subject, but the real pain and what we want to handle and what we are handling is deep work, is real tasks, is all to help these workers to really help them like as an assistant, not only on search bar, like as an assistant on real tasks, uh, real added value tasks. So inside it was Can you give work. us an example of that? Is it like that it pops up when it sees me um, working on Notion and talking about or creating a PRD and then it says, oh, this might be useful for your PRD because you were searching about that a mm -hmm. week ago or whatever. Mm -hmm. Like, for instance, um, so we are working with companies that have from 100 employees to several thousand employees. Um, for instance, uh, when you have to create a commercial proposal uh, as a salesperson in a company, you have like an history with a company, an history in this ecosystem, an history with, in this like environment, and you have to capitalize on all these commercial proposition that you did in the past in your company. You can have like thousands of, uh, of propositions, you can have thousands of documents, you can have reporting from different departments depending of like the industry you are working on, and with that, with, with the tool, so you can ask a question, you can capitalize on this document and you, create, you can easily create new proposal by asking questions, by interacting with the tool 
to go deeply in this use case and to create something that is really relevant for your new use case and that is using really the knowledge that you have in your company. And so it's not only like retrieve or just like find me as a last proposition of this client. Client is more like, okay, use the X past proposals to create a new one. And that's a real challenge that is linked to our subjects. It's because it's not only like retrieve one, two, or even 10 documents. It's about retrieving like 100, 200, a lot of documents, a lot of information, and you have a real like, you know, um, something to do with a lot of documents, a lot of context, a lot of informations you have to manage. I have the, uh, the million dollar question that I think is probably <laughs> coming through everyone's head is like, you're retrieving so many documents. How are you evaluating your retrieval? That's, <laughs> that's definitely the $1 million question. Um, it's a tough task to do, to be honest, to be fair. Um, currently, what we are doing is that we monitor every task of the process. So we have the output of every task. On each task, we use a scoring system to, to, to evaluate if it's relevant to uh, of the initial question or the initial task of the user. And we have a global scoring system on all the, the system. So it's quite hard. It's a little bit empiric, but it works for now. And it really helps us to also improve over time all the tasks and all the processes that are done by the tool. So it's really important. And for instance, you have this uh, kind of framework that is called uh, RAG triad, you know, um, that is a way to evaluate RAG uh, on the uh, on the um, on the accuracy of the context you you retrieve on uh, uh, the link with the initial question and uh, so on several parameters and you can really like have a first uh, way to evaluate the the quality of answers and the quality of everything on each steps. I love it. Can you go more into uh, the tech that you use for each one of these steps, yep. uh, the stack in architecture? So the, the process is quite like it, it, um, it starts at the moment we ingest documents uh, because basically it's hard to retrieve good documents or retrieve documents in a proper way if you don't parse it uh, well, if you just like the dumb rag, as I call it, is like, okay, you take a document, you, you divide it in text and that's it. But you will definitely lose the context, the global context of the document, what the document in general is, uh, is talking about. And you really need to, to do it properly and to keep this context. And that's a real challenge because if you keep some noises, if you don't do that well, like everything will be broken at, at the end. So technically, how it works, um, so we have a proper system that we developed to ingest documents using like technologies, open source technologies. We, we like, we only exclusively use open source tools because of security aspects and stuff like that. That's why also we are using Quadrant. One of the important points on that, of that. Um, so we have a system, we are using like, you know, this serverless stuff to ingest document over time. We have also models that create, uh, that create tags on documents. So we use open source SLMs to tag documents, to, to um, enrich documents also, to create a new title, to create a summary of documents, to keep the context. When we divide the document, we keep the title of paragraphers, the context inside paragraphers, and we leak every piece of text between each other to keep the context. After that, when we retrieve the document, so it's like the retrieving part, we have um, a new breed search system. We are using Quadrant on the semantic part. Uh, so basically we are creating embedding, we are storing it into Quadrant. We are performing a, um, similarity search to retrieve documents based on title, summary, filtering on tags and, uh, and on the semantic context. And we have also some keyword search, but it's more for specific tasks, like when we know that we need a specific document uh, at some point, we are searching it with a keyword search. 
So it's like a kind of hybrid system that is using deterministic approach with filtering with, uh, with tags and a probabilistic approach with selecting document with this hybrid search, search and doing a scoring system after, after that to get what is the most relevant document and to select how much content we will take from each document. It's a little bit techy, but it's uh, like, um, yeah, it's like really cool to, to create and we have like a way to evolve it and to improve it. Uh, <laughs> I that's think. what we like around here man we mm. want the techie stuff I, that's what i think everybody signed up for so that's <laughs> very cool one question that definitely comes up a lot when it comes to rags and when you're ingesting documents and then when you're retrieving documents and updating documents how do you make sure that the documents that you are let's say i know there's probably a hypothetical hr scenario where the company has a certain policy and they say you can have European style holidays. You get like three months of holidays a year or even French style holidays. Basically, you just don't work and whenever you want, you can work. <laughs> if you don't want, you don't work. And then all of a sudden, a U.S. company comes and takes it over and they say, no, -uh, you guys don't get holidays. Even when you do get holidays, you're not working or you are working. And so... <laughs> You have to update all the HR documents, right? So now when you have this knowledge worker that is creating something or when you have anyone that is getting help, like this co-pilot help, how do you make sure that the information that person is getting is the most up-to-date information possible? That's a new $1 million question. <laughs> Um, Dude, I'm coming with the hits today. I don't know <laughs> what you were looking for. Um, that's a really good question. So basically, you have several possibilities on that. On that, first one, you have like you know this uh, this PowerPoint presentation V1, V2, VF, VF.1, VF.2, etc. That's a mess in the knowledge bases and. Sometimes you just want to use the most updated, up-to-date documents. So basically we can filter on the created at and the, the date of the documents. Sometimes you want to also compare the evolution of the process over time. So that's another use case. Um, basically we base, so during the ingestion, we are performing, so we are analyzing if date is inside the document, because sometimes in documentation you have like the date at the end of the document or at the beginning of the document. That's the first way to do it. We have the date of the creation of the document, but it's not a source of truth, because sometimes you created it after or you duplicated it and the date is not the same, depending if you are working on Windows, Microsoft, stuff like that. It's definitely a mess. And so, and also we compare documents. So when we retrieve the documents and documents are really similar one to each other, we keep it in mind and we try to give more information as possible. Sometimes it's not possible. So it's not 100%, it's not bulletproof, but it's a real question of, of that. So it's a partial answer of your, of your, of your question, but it's like, some way we are all, uh, today um, filtering and, uh, and, uh, and answering on this special uh, topic. Now I wonder what was like the most challenging part of, build, of building this frag? Mm, Since there was like... I, I, is a lot, is there are a lot of parts that are <laughs> really challenging. Are challenging. Um, one of uh, the challenging part was the scalability of the system. Um, we are like we have clients that come like on with tera, tera octet of data and want to be passed like really fast. And so you have the ingestion, but even after, uh, like the. The semantic search, uh, even on like a large data set, is, can be slow. And today, ChatGPT answers really fast. So your users, even if the question is like way more complicated to answer than a basic ChatGPT question, they want to have their answer in seconds. Uh -huh. So you have also this challenge that is really 
you have to take care. So it's quite challenging and it's like, you know, this industrial supply chain. So when you upgrade something, you have to be sure that everything is working well on the other side. And um, that's a real challenge uh, to handle. And we are still on it because we are still evolving and getting more data. And um, at the end of the day, like you have to, to, to be sure that everything is working well in terms of LLM, but in terms of research and to in terms also of UX to give some insight to the user of what is working under the hood to give them like the possibility to wait a few seconds more but starting to give them a, a piece of answer like yeah it's funny you say that because i remember talking to somebody that was working at u.com and they were saying how there's like the actual time and then so they were calling it something like perceived time and real like actual time. So Ooh. you as an end user, if you get asked a question or maybe there's like a trivia quiz while the question is coming up, then it seems like it's not actually taking as long as it is. Mm. Even if it takes mm. five seconds, you're, it's a little bit cooler. Or as you were mentioning, I, I remember reading some paper, I think, on how people are a lot less anxious if they see the words starting to pop up like that mm -hmm. and they see like okay it's not just i'm waiting and then the whole answer gets spit back out at me it's like i see the answer forming as it is in real time and so that can calm people's nerves too mm. yeah definitely like you have a lot i, I mean human human's brain is like marvelous on that and and you have a lot of stuff like one of my favorites is the illusion of work. Do you know it? It's like it's the total opposite. Like if you have something that seems difficult to do, adding more time of processing oh, can yeah. can like so the user will imagine that it's really a hard task to do. <laughs> and so that, that's really funny. Like it's so funny, like that. Man. Yeah. Yes. Like it's the opposite of what you you would think if you create a product, but that's real stuff. And mm -hmm. um, sometimes just to output them that you are performing like those tasks in the background, it's like it helps them to to to. Oh yes, my question was really really like a complex question. Uh, like you have a lot of work to do. If you so it's it's. A dual, um, you know, a double edged sword. Like, if you answer too fast, like, they will not trust the answer. And it's the opposite. If you answer too slow, you can have this, okay, but it should be dumb because it's really slow. So it's a dumb AI or stuff like that. So that's, uh, that's really, that's, that's really funny. My, my co founder actually, like, was a product guy. So really focused on product and he really loves this kind of stuff. So, yeah. <laughs> Great thought experiment. That's interesting. And you mentioned like uh, you chose Quadrant because it's open source. But now I wonder if there's also something to do with your need for something that that's fast, that's scalable. And what other mm -hmm. factors you took in consideration when choosing the vector DB? Mm, yes. Uh, so uh, uh, I told you that the scalability and the speed is like one of the most important points and those part to handle. And yes, definitely. Because when you are building a complex rag, you are not like just performing one research at some point. You are like, you know, doing it, maybe like you are like, you know, splitting the question, doing several at the same time. And so you must, it's like mandatory to have a vector database that is scalable, that is fast, that can handle, uh, that has low latency, that can handle parallel requests, a, lo a large amount of requests. So you have really this need and Quadrant was like an obvious uh, choose. We actually, we, we, we did a benchmark. So we really like tried several possibilities. Uh, some, Tell me more. Yeah. We tried, we tried, so we tried the classic Postgre, uh, you know, PG vectors that is, I think we tried it like 30 minutes and we realized really fast that it was really not um, good for our use case. We tried Wiviet, we tried Milvus, we tried Quadrant, we tried a lot. We tried, uh, so 
we, we use only like we, we prefer use open source because of security uh, issues. We tried Pinecone initially. We were on Pinecone uh, at the beginning of the company. Um, and so the, the most important point, so we have the, 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 the speed of, of the tool, we have the scalability. We have also, maybe it's a little bit dumb to say that, but we have also the, the API. I mean, like, I remember using Pinecone and trying just to you know, get all vectors and it was not possible somehow. And you have like this dumb stuff that are sometimes like really strange. And if you have a tool that is... Uh, 100% made for your use case with people that are working on it, really dedicated on that and that are aligned with your vision of what is the evolution of this. I think it's like the best tool you have to choose. So one thing that I would love to hear about too is when you're looking at your system and you're looking at just the, the product in general, what are some of the key metrics that you are constantly monitoring and how do you know that like you're hitting them or you're not and then like if you're not hitting them what are some ways that you debug the situation mm, by metrics you mean like usage metrics or like i'm i'm more thinking on like your your whole tech setup and the quality of your rag mm. Mm. so Basically, so we, we are focused on, on industry of knowledge workers and industry in particular, like of consultants. So we have a lot, uh, some data set of questions that we know should be answered well. We know the kind of outputs we should have. The metrics we are like monitoring on, the, on our RAG is mostly the accuracy of the answer, the accuracy of sources, the number of hallucinations that is sometimes really also hard to, to manage. Um, we are so, actually, so our tool is sourcing everything when you ask a question or when you perform a task. It's, it gives you the, the, all the sources. But sometimes you, you know, like you can have a perfect answer and just like a, one number inside your answer that comes from nowhere, that is totally like uh, invented. Yeah. And that's hard to that's hard to get. We are still working on that. We are not the most advanced on this part. We use um, so uh, uh, we just implemented uh, a tool. Uh, I think you may know it's uh, Long Fuse. Do you know them? L Long Fuse. No, tell me more. L Long Fuse is like a tool. So um, that is. Uh, made to monitor tasks on your rack so you can like easily log stuff it's also an open source tool you can easily self-host it and you you can monitor every part of your rag and you can create data sets based on questions and answers that has been asked or or some you 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 created by yourself and you can easily perform like you know check of your rag just to to try it out and to give a final score of it and to be able to monitor everything and to give a global score based on your data set of your rag. And we are not, so we are currently implementing it. It's, uh, I, I give their, their name because it's wonderful, the work they did, and I really enjoyed it. And, and yeah, uh, I, it's one of the most important points to not be blind. I mean, in general, in terms of business, you have to, to follow metrics. You have to, like numbers cannot lie, humans lie, but not numbers. But after that, you have to interpret numbers. So that's also another toss part. But it's important to have the good metrics and to be able to know if you are evolving it, if you are improving, improving your, your, your system and if everything is working. And so, yeah, some, yeah, basically it's, the, the, the different stuff we are we are doing we are not mm. like yeah yeah, right. yeah yeah are you getting mm. are you collecting like human feedback for the hallucinations part we try but uh, humans are not like giving a lot of feedback it's but, hard huh that's why I yes asked. it's really hard <laughs> <laughs> to get yeah, the end user to do anything even just like the thumbs up thumbs down can yes be difficult. We, we tried we tried several stuff we have the thumbs up thumbs down we tried like you know 
stars, like yeah. fit, you, you, you start like, you know, you, you ask your real feedback, like to write something, hey, please help us uh, to, to, but no. Yeah. And yeah, to have human feedback is quite, quite tall. So we are not counting on that. <laughs> I think the hard part about it, at least me as an end user, whenever I've been using these is like the thumbs down or the, I've even seen it go as far as like you have more than just one emoji. Like maybe you have the thumbs up, you have the thumbs down, you have like a mushroom emoji. So it's like hallucinated Ooh. and you have like, a, um, what was the other one that I saw that I thought was pretty, I can't remember it right now, but I never it, saw the mushroom, but that's quite fun. Yeah, <laughs> it's good. It's like, it's not just wrong. It's absolutely like way <laughs> off the mark. And what I think is, is interesting there when I've been the end user is that it's a little bit just like, ah, uh, I don't have time to explain the nuances as to why this is not useful. Like mm. I really would have to sit down and almost like write a book or at least an essay on mm. Yeah, this is kind of useful, but it's like a two out of a five, not a four out of a five. And so that's why I give it the thumbs down or the there was this part that is good and that part's bad. And so mm. it's just like the ways that you have to or the nuances that you have to go into as the end user when you are trying to evaluate it. I think it's much better. And what I've seen a lot of people do is just, yeah, expect to do that in-house after the fact you get all the information back, you see on certain metrics, like, oh, did this person commit the code? Then that's a good signal that it's useful, but then you can also look at it, or did this person like copy paste it, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and how can we see mm. if they didn't copy paste that, or if they didn't take that next action that we would expect them to take, why not? And let's try and dig into what we can do to make that better. Mm -hmm. Yes, we can also like evaluate the next questions, you know, like mm. the following questions. That's uh, a great point. We too. are not we are not currently doing it like uh, in an, um, uh, like I mean automatically. But if you see that a user like just answer no, it's not true. Like or you should uh, rephrase it or be more concise or this kind of you know like following questions. You know that the first answer was not like as as relevant as. That, that's wanted. such a great point and yeah. or <laughs> you do some sentiment analysis and it slowly is getting more and more angry <laughs> yeah that's true that's a good point also yeah to to, yeah. to. and like uh, ooh, this yeah. one went downhill fast so <laughs> all right cool i think um i think that's it sabrina any last questions from your side um yeah i think i'm just very interesting to know like from a user perspective from a virtual brain like um, how are traditional models uh, worse or what kind of errors virtual brain fixes in their uh, structure that users find it better that way? Mm. I think um, in this particular, so we talked about hallucinations. And yeah. I think it's like one of the main issues people have on, on I mean, classic LLMs. We really think that when you create a one size fit all tool, you have some trouble because you have to manage different approaches. Like when you are creating Copilot as Microsoft, you have to handle the use cases of everyone. And, and I, I really think that so our AI is not trained to, to write you uh, a speech uh, based on Shakespeare and with the style of Martin Luther King. It's not the purpose of the tool. So if you ask something that is un like out of the box, he will just say like, okay, I, I don't know how to answer that. And that's an important point. That's a feature by itself to be able to not go outside of the box. And so we did this choice of putting, of really like put the AI inside the box, the box that is containing basically all the knowledge of your company, all the, like, the retrieved knowledge, uh, actually. And we do not have a lot of hallucination. I, I would not say like 0%, but it's close to zero. 
because we we analyze the question, we put the AI in a box, we enforce the AI to think about the answer before answering, and we analyze also the answer to know if the answer is relevant. And that's an important point that we want, we, we are fixing and we fix for our user and we prefer, yes, to, to give like non-answers and a bad answer. Absolutely. And there are people who think like, hey, this is a rag is not going to hallucinate. And that's not the case at all. Like, mm. it, it will hallucinate less inside a certain context window that you provide, right? But mm. it still has a possibility. So minimizing that as much as possible is very, very valuable. So, so good. Cool. Yeah. Well, I think with that, our time here is coming to an end. I really appreciate this. I encourage everyone to go and have a little look at virtual brain we'll drop a link in the comment in case anyone it's wants. free to sign up so you can like try it for free even better look at that <laughs> christmas came early <laughs> so well let's go have some fun play around with it and uh i can't promise but i may give you some feedback i may give you some evaluation metrics if it's so hallucinating if, or what if i see some like thumbs up or thumbs down i will know that it's you yeah yeah cool <laughs> <laughs> exactly all right folks that's about it for today we will see you all later as a reminder don't get lost in vector space this is been another vector space talks and if you want to come on here and chat with us feel free to reach out see ya cool see, see you guys ya. thank you bye